This is the point of view, and it's a budget day special. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata read his budget for over two hours, and he says it's a road year for 2020, and he says it's a good news budget, which will focus on some positive things. Of course, the minority says it's a budget that is going to mark the exit of the MPP from government. So now we're going to look at the budget from a very apolitical view. I have three luminaries from the economic and financial world to dissect Ghana's economy using the budget as a reference point. It's going to be very exciting. Stay tuned. So on the point of view tonight, we will be asking seven questions of three people. And it will simply be around the economy and how it's treating you. But it's an interactive show. We don't want to hog the airwaves. So we're going to ask you to comment on how the economy is treating you and what you make of the budget. We have a WhatsApp number on the screen. And we also have a Facebook stream that if you're watching online, you can contribute to. So we will look at the budget and the economy, the good part. Then we'll also look at what is bad about the economy. We'll also try and answer the question of where is all the money? We're told that there's no money in the system. A lot of people are complaining. We'll ask what happened to all the money. We'll ask whether Ghana's debt is sustainable because that's an issue that has come up for a lot of discussion. We'll also try and examine issues around employment because that's the key issue. Most young people say they don't have work to do. Is NAPCO enough or do we need a more sustainable way of creating jobs? What about the 5 billion Ghana CD uh, shortfall in revenue mobilization? And government also says we're not going to raise taxes. So it's a mixed bag for the discussion. And I have three interesting people. I'm going to talk to my economics professor at the University of Ghana. He is the man who taught me economics from level 200 to 400. He's now the head of the department. We'll also be joined by the head of research for the Trade Union Congress. And then also somebody from KPMG who's been focused on this aspect of the economy. Before we introduce my guest, let me take you quickly to Parliament for a quick summary of what happened today with a report by Duke Mensa Opoku. By these interventions, Mr. Speaker, we have put money either directly or indirectly into the pockets of many Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, from 2017 to date, these interventions by government have put at least 12.2 billion in the pockets of Ghanaians. Specifically, free SHS has saved parents a total of 1.8 billion Ghana cities over the last three years, and that's money in their pockets. Planting for food and jobs has saved farmers a total of 844 million cities over the last four, three years for satisfied fertilizer. And this is money in their pocket. A total of 357 million have been put into the pockets of teacher trainees within the last three years in the form allowances, and this is money in their pockets. A total of 336 million Ghana cities have been put into the pockets of nursing trainees within the last three years in the form of allowances, and this is money in their pocket. Subsidy for BEC registration fee has saved parents a total of 65 million Ghana cities over the last two years, and that is money in their pockets. The electricity tariff reduction affected by PRS effective March 15, 2018 resulted in savings of 1.8 billion for a year for residential and non-residential customers, and this is money in their pockets. The, the reduction and abolition of taxes, including the 50% reduction in import duty, has saved taxpayers a total of 4.1 billion over the last three years, and this is money in their pockets. The, there are over 350,000 jobs that have been created in the public sector, including 100,000 NAPO graduates, has provided total earnings to them of 2.9 billion Ghana cities, and that's money in their pockets. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the question that should be asked is, what social interventions? Mr. Speaker, the question that should be asked, is what social interventions did the NDC implement in their eight years in office to reduce the suffering of Ghanaians? Mr. Speaker, we should also not forget that government has, through the financial sector cleanup, saved the deposits of 4.6 million depositors who would otherwise have lost. So that was Finance Minister Kenoferiata. He says he's put money in your pocket. You can answer that. So I have three guests. Now I have Robert Jato. He's a senior manager, head of operation and strategy KPMG, which is a firm, an audit firm. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you. 
I also have uh, Dr. Kwabna Nyakumotu, who's the research director of Ghana's Trade Union Congress. Doc, great to have you. Thank you. And our Professor William Bab Watson, head of economics department, University of Ghana. Prof, great to have you. Thank you. Good. So I have three guests and I have a few questions to ask. My first question is, what is good about the economy and the budget that we had? I'm going to give each of you like two, three minutes. What are the positives with this budget? Maybe let me start with you, uh, Mr. Jato. From your perspective and from my analysis, what are some of the top three good things about this economy? Okay. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, I think that, um, as you'd imagine, the budget has just been read. The full import of that we are uh, analyzing. Uh, but I think high level, um, you know, uh, the commitment from the finance minister and I guess from government to uh, remain disciplined on the fiscal side, I think is, is, is a good one. It's important to remember that that falls within the Fiscal Responsibility Act that they have publicly committed to. I think also key is also the macro uh, economic direction. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, there are some broad targets that we've set for ourselves and I think from what we've heard today, um, that that's that's on call. That's that's good. Um, the the bit maybe that we need to pay attention to is on the fiscal side. And I think when you look at an economy, it's important to look at it from the real economy perspective, but also the other sectors like the monetary sector, the real sector, but also the external sector. Because whatever we are achieving or have achieved over the last few years, the external shocks are things that we need to pay attention to. But overall, it would appear, um, given that this is we are the uh, turn of an election year, um, you would expect that that commitment is very critical and we need to um, applaud them for that. Um, I think the revenue side has been a challenge. Uh, maybe we can talk about that. I'll we'll come um, to the challenges. Sure. So fiscal discipline and commitment is great. Macroeconomic direction is fine. But you feel on the revenue side, we can do better. Sure. TUC, do you see anything good about this economy? Oh, to a large extent. Okay. The statistics appear good. Okay. Growth is still strong. Inflation is coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget deficit is still below what is prescribed by the Fiscal uh, Responsibility Act, 4.5%. Mm. Uh, the international reserve position appears okay, mm. about 4.1 months of import. Uh, the external balances are also good. Uh, you have um, a much reduced current account deficit. Um, the primary surplus we recorded last year has entered into deficit now. Mm. But as the president stated in the last State of the Nations address, this is perhaps not the only time you have had this set of good figures. Mm. There's always uh, a caveat that our economy remains fragile. Mm -hmm. And there's also the temptation that with um, one flip of a bad decision as we enter uh, elections, all of these gains could be wiped out because they are not really strengthened. They are not really firmly on the ground and we need to guard against. Uh, so these are good things about surface good. Yeah. Which, which, which need to be solidified. A lot. Otherwise, with a little shock, yeah. you are down. Exactly. But you are mentioning interesting things. Fisc you are also using the word fiscal, external, these very technical, nice, yeah. nice things. Yeah. I see. So you, you largely are on the same page. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to what is good about the economy? Well, just to summarize, stability. Stability. Yeah. The economy is stable. About the macro mm. stability. Mm. And of course, you find macro stability to be the foundation for an economy to take off. Okay. Uh, and the point is that we've had macro stability many times mm -hmm. as to whether we've been able to leverage that macro stability to be able to move into areas that people will mm. see the benefit is where the challenge is. So but in some macro stability is great. Yes. And, and what we teach the class as first order condition. I mean, you expect stability before you can take off. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if we have stability, I don't think uh, in the end in itself, you need to uh, move it up to be able to impact on the micro aspect of the economy. So it's a necessary but insufficient condition for exactly. people's well-being to improve. Excellent. Great. What, what are you worried about with the economy? What concerns you? Apart from the good things you've seen, what are you concerned about? Uh, I, I think that um, the revenue side, like we, we all admit, uh, it's quite challenged. Um, I think even if you stretch that a little bit to some of the 
uh, concerns that have been expressed by business. And KPMG carried out a pre-budget survey. Uh, mm -hmm. And broadly, if you look at um, consistently over the last three years that we've carried the survey out, uh, there are thematic areas that have come up. One is cost of doing business. Um, and critical also is cost and access to credit. And of course, the volatility of the currency. Mm -hmm. On the fiscal side, it's been the taxpayer experience uh, or tax administration, which, which is uh, uh, a challenge. So these are broad areas that uh, people expect that there will be uh, some policy measures to you know, drive uh, forward. I think that we cannot ignore the concerns expressed by people around um, some liquidity challenges. Uh, also, maybe speculative, but also tied to some banking sector uh, reforms. Uh, we cannot ignore that. And maybe what we need to ask ourselves is how do we restore confidence? And, and I think that's an, an important point as well. You've confidence. mentioned five things. Revenue is not good. Cost of doing business is high. Cost of credit, very high. Cost and assets. Volatility of the currency. And then liquidity challenges, otherwise known as no money in the system. You are using very nice jargons. <laughs> I like that. V liquidity challenges or no money in the system. So that's what, is, that's what we are concerned about. Well, that's, that's these are the, the views these expressed are the by the business community. Okay, so um, this, this is what your base, survey found. Based on some of our surveys, yes. Which of these is the most important threat to the economy? I think that it's, it's important to bear in mind that uh, the fiscal side is important, which is the revenue side, because some of the key things that we want to do as a country, be it from infrastructure investment or the digital um, uh, positioning of government, that will require some uh, money. So if you are to, so uh, to rank them, revenue will be, the will be critical. The lack of rev enough revenue would be your number one. Because that then automatically feeds back to uh, how do we finance our deficit. And that then exposes us, if we go borrowing, um, to, I mean, borrowing from external sources, then that, that puts our currency at risk as well. Mm. But what so if government says they are cutting their quota according to their size, they are not spending as much. If you look for the 2019 budget, they didn't spend as much as they, they wanted to. In a sense, they are trying to respect the lack of revenue by cutting their quota. Does that give you any comfort? That's good um, to the extent that that doesn't take away the fact that we still need to be a bit more innovative, creative, and aggressive in mobilizing domestic resources. And I mm. think that's very, very important. Okay. Uh, Doc, if you were to give me your top four or five concerns about this economy in order of importance, what would you, you say? I think the first most important thing for those of us in the unions is how do you translate the stability, mm -hmm. the growth, into real improvement in people's life. Mm -hmm. And here, job creation matters. I mean, the only sustainable way you can reduce poverty and hardship is to put people in productive employment. Mm -hmm. where they are earning good incomes and be able to take care of themselves. So far, and Prof is right, this is not the first time we have had this stability. It hasn't so much translated into job creation mm. and also into improvement in people's lives. And it gets to a point where people become a bit cynical about the stability we celebrate. People continuously say, and sometimes we dismiss it, that we are not feeling the stability in our pocket. And I think it's a challenge we need to address. On the question of revenue, uh, Bernard, it's simple and easy to say we are cutting the, the quote according to our size. You, you are eliminating certain expenditures. But that elimination has welfare implications. The moment you cut, <laughs> you, yeah, you have welfare implications. The most important thing is for government to match the cutting with measures that promote revenue generation. And there are many areas in our budget and in our public life for which government should be able to raise revenues. Mm. You mentioned the figure of uh, about 5 point something billion shortfall. Yes. I mean, in 2017 alone, tax exemptions cost this nation over 5.7 billion. And the question is, who benefits from those exemptions? There's a, a company at the port called MPS. That was granted tax exemption to the tune of $834 million. Why did we do that? And what benefit are we deriving from that? Okay. So we need to look at these exemptions. I and mean, the budget also was clear that 
there are some areas where we are losing revenue. Uh, uh, in the last town hall meeting by the economic management team, mm -hmm. uh, import benchmark revenues were slashed. And the budget is saying that that has resulted in low revenues. The TUC stated that we should have done a cost-benefit analysis. At the same time, the expected reduction in prices at Abosokai, nobody sees it. So it is important that you check those things. The budget also indicated that we are losing revenue because we are admitting a large number of our imports into zero rated. Mm -hmm. Because we are signing free trade deals. And it is important to know that in the budget, there is information on the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, which we have ratified uh, almost secretly. Nobody heard about the ratification. But the budget is telling us that from 2020, we need to kickstart the liberalization. That liberalization means that we are going to reduce import tariff for goods that are coming from the European Union. And that will have <coughs> re uh, revenue implications. The point I'm making is that we need to be able to translate the gains in macroeconomic stability into real improvement in people's lives. So you, that, that's a main issue. It's a main issue. The, the stability hasn't translated to job creation and, you see, and that, hasn't translated into improvement in people's lives. In people's lives. And you see, that is an area that eventually put pressure on governments to do something to be able to suit the, the population. And that eventually means that mm. we are likely to undo the gains that we have made. If stability hangs in the air, it's fragile. People become cynical, and they want to ask questions. This growth. And you see, again, if you look at the budget, where is the growth coming from? From mining and oil. How are these impacting the lives of Ghanaians? It is important that we interrogate the stability and the growth. Prof, he gave five concerns, he gave two. What I, when we look at the economy, what, what are you concerned about? Well, I think uh, what I have is similar to DS, but maybe I'll move into expenditure. We haven't touched on expenditure, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of waste in expenditure. I understand the revenue side where we have exemptions being uh, waste uh, in quotes, where money is going into individuals' pocket, but the state is suffering. And that is something that I think needs to be looked at, that we also have waste uh, in expenditure. Expansion. And I think uh, it's hard time we, 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 we take a very serious look at. And sometimes some of the waste affect the policymakers themselves, politicians themselves, big men. And if those sacrifices are not made, it becomes very difficult. Uh, maybe we need to interrogate it by putting figures on it and we'll be able to understand. Mm -hmm. Nobody has been able to tell me that if we have a lot of uh, public employees uh, having uh, vehicles, mm -hmm. and some one or two, these vehicles are maintained are fueled almost every day. Nobody has been able to tell me that civil servants will complain that they are not well paid, even though uh, the wage bill continues to be very challenging. But they will say that, well, our salaries are very low. And you can see that they are low. But then we still have them benefiting from some of these things. For instance, if you have uh, maybe a public servant living in a bungalow, that if it's supposed to be quantified, uh, it will have been in millions of cities. So if you quantify this, assuming that you are able to convert this to private uh, maybe facility and then giving out, the kind of money that you will get, you can pay, you can double or triple or even quadruple that person's salary, and that person will be far, far better off than the current situation. So I'm saying that we have a lot of waste in the expenditure side. And when you come to revenue, we are always thinking about revenue is not enough, and we've mentioned uh, exemptions. Even down there, we haven't looked at other areas that we need to uh, have our revenue uh, go up. Many people are collecting taxes from businesses. And uh, my colleague from KPMG was talking about uh, cost of doing business. You, look, you go to small businesses and they will tell you the number of levies, taxes, and so on that they pay. But you also go to government. Government say that, well, the revenue is not enough. That means where is the revenue going? Perhaps it's going into individual's pocket. So if you are able to uh, close those leakages 
and come up with innovative ways, especially just looking at electronics, to be able to get taxpayers uh, pay their taxes directly to where it's supposed to go. Government may not be able to complain that we, we are having problems. So you talk revenue. about re re expenditure and then revenue. You are saying that expenditure, there's still a lot of waste in the system. When you look at ESS numbers, if you look at the expenditure pattern for the first three months, the quarters of the year, we spent a large chunk of our expenditures on interest payments, then the second chunk on CAPEX before goods and services at the bottom. Although for capital expenditure, we spent 44% below target because we couldn't raise enough revenue. Our capital expenditure of 2.5 billion as at end of July was about half 45% below target. Is this a good picture? You're spending majority of your expenditure on interest payments. And then you are cutting down on capital expenditure because you don't have enough revenue. The, the, the point is that uh, there is look like a cyclical kind of problem. If you are spending this much uh, to service your debt, when you go the debt, what did you use the debt for? Because when you borrow, you are expected to use that particular money in a way that will generate returns to be able to pay. So if indeed you've been able to invest that kind of money in productive uh, ventures, that will be able to get your returns through revenue increases to be able to pay this. So if on the revenue side we are crying, but we are paying this, it means that what did we use our uh, But the interest uh, are, borrowing. for, are for borrowings done, I mean, for example, you have maturing 10-year bonds exactly. and stuff like that. Yes. 2007, we went to borrow. Yeah. We used some of the money to do all kinds of things, yes. and we're paying in 2013. Yes. And yes. So these are legacy debts. Yes, and I'm going back. So I'm not saying, we're not talking about a particular government. Yes. We are talking about Ghana. Mm -hmm. So if we borrowed in 1995 and we didn't use it well, it means that it will come back and, and hurt you in future. For instance, if you borrow and you use the construct roads, and the road is so good. I mean, you go to advanced countries and they construct road, and it takes about 50 years, 100 years. They will just do some patches. Mm. In Ghana, we borrow money to construct roads, and it takes just three Let me years ask you a question. Years. Finance Minister says, except for interest payments, all expenditure line items were contained within the respective budgets. So the only expenditure item that went above board was interest payments. Quick comments on and that. And it's statutory, so there's nothing you, there's can, nothing you can do about yes. it. So this one, we can't touch it. Yes. It's okay. Well, um, I think it's, it's, it's a question of um, what... what, what where are we coming from and then also where are we going. And I think that it's also important to pay attention to even the 2020 budget in terms of how much of the revenue will go into servicing of, uh, of, of, of wages and, and salaries and, and servicing of debt and payment of debt. So a quick calculation uh, gives you a sense that even in the 2020 budget, it's not just the historical 2020 budget, we're looking close to 60, 65 odd percent of our domestic revenue going to servicing wages mm. and salaries. And so um, the question then is how much is left to invest in critical infrastructure? And I think that's a challenge, which is why I go back to the point I made earlier on, that we really need to broaden our task base. We need to accelerate domestic revenue mobilization. And it is good to see um, that there has been some announcements around how do we drive that expansion of, of, of bringing more people into the task net? Uh, and, and more importantly, what transformation and reforms do we need at the GRE and our revenue agencies to drive that um, growth in revenue? Let's go to debt quickly. Are our debt sustainable? Are we in a sustainable debt situation? I'm going back to ISE. I was at their state of Ghana economy. They were saying some very interesting things about debt. Listening to the finance minister, are you concerned about because, of course, we've rebased the economy, so debt to GDP is lower. Some people say debt to GDP is not even a sensible measure, no. be that as it may. ISA is telling us that Ghana is listed as one of the countries in, at risk of severe debt distress. The government says they've uh, reprofiled our debt and we're in a better position. What is your analysis saying about our debt? Um, clearly, I mean, again, in the absence of... Um any other data, what has been announced is what we are going on. Um, I, I genuinely think that we cannot continue to borrow forever, and I think that's an important point to remember. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, now, it makes sense, um, from my point of view, that if you have an expensive debt and you have 
work on, on your macro and therefore you're able to um, refinance that debt at a cheaper cost. Mm -hmm. And then, then it may be a sensible thing to do. However, if that then extends the tenure of the debt, then ultimately you're going to pay more in the long term. Um, and I think that we cannot continue to borrow our way out of um, developing our country. Are you and, concerned and, about our debt situation? I mean, clearly we, we, we are. Um, again, if you look at it in the context of um, debt to GDP ratio, uh, we may be doing well. However, uh, like I said, my concern is that we cannot continue to Doc, grow our way. What do you think about our debt situation? I think it's, uh, it's worrying from all the indications and the statistics available. And he's right that we cannot continue to go the way we are going. And it's important also because, I mean, if the single largest expenditure item in your budget is to service debt, straight away, that's worrying. Mm. Especially in the context where it is not sometimes too clear where we actually use some of these monies we borrowed for. And I mean, people will tell you we build roads, but we also know that the road that was supposed to last for 10 years, mm -hmm. in fact, today we need another loan to rebuild that road. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is, is, is serious, and we cannot go that way. I mean, people have compared the wages and salaries component. That one, uh, Bernard, you know, he paid somebody who fed the family. But the debt, some of them, we are not too sure what we use the money for. But if you borrow, you see, but I think you are the people who ask for salary increases. And because that's consumption expenditure. If I borrow money and I used to build a road and I told the road, mm -hmm. that's borrowing for something that can pay for itself. But if I but borrow and I use it to increase your salary. But the point is that if you told the road, the revenue that you get from the two, do you, does it come to where it's supposed to go? I mean, if you are just driving, and then somebody gets, those who are collecting the tolls, they pick anything and then they give it to you and collect the money. You use the road, but the money, money will go to somebody's so pocket. So there's and waste in even in the tolling. The, I mean, no, everybody apart, knows that there is that way. Apart from that, I mean, the, 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 the road which we took a loan to build, just at the toll booth, see the pothole there. Yes. And you are paying. I mean, it's, it's very disgusting to pay a road toll from Takradi to Tawa. I mean, I was discussing with my boys that if you apply that road, government should pay you something. <laughs> because, and, but on the other hand, you end up paying. And check with those who have been to Takwa. There's no way you should tow that road. And he's right. Where, where is our tow money now? We have collateralized it, even that one. So even the ones we are collecting is going into paying debt. There's something wrong with the way we have. So you're not happy with the debt issue at all? No, 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 I'm not. Okay, I'll take a short break. When I come back, I'll talk to you about debt. We have a few more questions to answer. This is the point of view. We're trying to look at the economy from a dispassionate, non-partisan point of view with KPMG, TUC, and academia. Stay with us. Welcome back to the point of view. We're trying to understand the economy in an hour. I have three guests, and we're trying to just run through a lot of questions. The good, the bad, the ugly. We're also looking at the debt situation and other aspects. Let's read a few of your comments. Bernard, I believe we should consider other modules for measuring the well-being of citizens, other than the macroeconomic indicators. What is tax revenue to GDP ratio to me when I have to pay more for transport, when my wife goes to hospital and the NHS is not working, and I have to pay out of pocket? I see what me. Good evening, Bernard. I'm Prince from Kufredia. The usual thing, the politics, politicians do is to say they give you nine cities to one person and give one city to two people to share. And the government goes around saying they put 10 cities in the pockets of three people. God is watching. Hi, Bernard. Ask me to comment on the state of the economy of our country. And I'll say, this government has not lived up to my expectations. How can they have all these 16 flagship programs, knowing very well that the economy cannot support them all? I see this as a big mistake. Bernard, this is campaign budget. Nothing in it to change the life of Ghanaians. Justice Affair has a long one. He says, Ben, maybe your guest can help me identify how the 2020 budget addresses the following. Enforcing the deposit insurance scheme against bank failures, implementing monetary policies that can drive financial liberation in the economy, and clean up of BOG and a restructured decentralized operational system. Charlie, that's this is a thesis you want me to do today. <laughs> um, ben, these budgets are taking us nowhere. A budget must be preceded by a national vision, goals, and objectives. Little by little, the budget should be taking us to that vision. Yearly value for money audits will confirm whether or not we're on the right path. 
All these are absent. Programs are not based on any objectives. Otherwise, even good by 3% would have made our per capita income very high. Moses in Bawe. Prof, are you concerned about our debt at all? Or they've said enough? Well, whether you're concerned about debt or not, you can look at the debt servicing. And if you think your debt is okay, then you have to look at debt to revenue. Mm. So debt service to revenue will then tell you. So I'll just make it simple. Like, if you want to know that you are, your debt position is good, just look at your, your debt service to revenue. Because if indeed you have the debt and debt that you contracted was used for in a productive way, it will generate revenue. And therefore, your revenue base will be very big. And therefore, you have that lower rate in terms of debt service to uh, uh, revenue. But if we have debt service revenue to be very high, then it means that you don't have to go to the GDP and see that debt to GDP is low, and therefore we are within. Because, I mean, in a simple way, you don't sell your asset to pay your debt. It is what the asset generates that you use to service the debt. So the best way to measure uh, our debt position is just look at the debt service to okay. revenue. And if you think that you are spending about 55% of your revenue to service debt, then you have a big challenge. When people say they don't have money in their pocket, do you understand them? Yes. Uh, you are talking about liquidity. And of course, I mean, if you have to buy goods and services and you need to, buy, you need to use cash, and the money that comes to you is not enough to be able to transact those businesses, then you can see but that. I, I, I just uh, played a voice clip of the minister before we started, talking about how he's put money in people's pockets, how free SHS puts money in people's pockets, how NAPCO puts money in people's pockets. He mentioned about six things that he believes put money in people's pockets. So are the people not seeing it? Or the transmission mechanism is not working. What's going on? So, uh, in, in simple, at the macro level, I mean, the money is going from government to the people. But those people who are benefiting will then, I mean, not everybody is benefiting directly from the free SHS. For instance, if you have 100 people and even 30 don't have their children uh, at senior high school, but they are paying school fees at the teacher level, then they will not benefit directly from SHS, but the person who would ben benefit from SHS will say that, well, I think money has come into my pocket. So what he was talking about will be an average kind of thing. While some people will be benefiting because directly they get something. Some people are paying other things because they don't benefit directly. Because when you speak to some other people, they will say that, well, my children go to uh, private schools and I pay this much. So that person will not feel it. But at the macro level, you look at the figures and you'll be able to tell that if you average it, then you see that on average, it is what going to the And that is why we see... But he, he also said we, they are paid contractors, unprecedented amounts. He mentioned about six different things he had done, which he believed was putting money in people's pockets. So I'm surprised that, for some of the viewers are saying they don't feel it. Is it that people are being disingenuous, or it takes time? So if you pay contractors $3 billion, you mm -hmm. re, um, sort of get a receiver to take over banks, and you pay people, depositors, their money. You do free SHS. And then you, I don't know, help build factories and all these things. I mean, do you get it when people say they don't feel it? Or is it that he's, he's, the minister is counting his chickens before they are hatched, that he needs to take time for people to start feeling it? Uh, KPMG. Well, um, I think from KPMG perspective, we, we, we understand when people express that view. Um, clearly, um, you know, there are a number of things that government has mentioned, and we all listen to the, to, the, to the budget in terms of some of the initiatives around NAPCO and things like that. And you expect that that creates job, and therefore people are in employment, and therefore they get paid, and therefore they should have uh, liquidity. Um, and I think that's fair to give some credit. Um, but it's also the question of are these people being paid on time? And if they are being paid, then um, there's the element of where do they put their money and uh, do they have access to it? So, for instance, if we come back to uh, link that to the banking sector, um, clearly people have some money locked up in, in, in banks and let's face the fact, uh, it, it's true. Receivers need to go through a certain process to be able to um, be able to pay that or pay uh, depositors, uh, but you then need to validate that. So, so it, it's a painful process and some element of that lack of liquidity could also be speculative. And I'll give you an example. If I have my money locked up somewhere, chances are that if I have some other money in another institution, I'll be you know, quick to go withdraw that, and that puts pressure on the system. 
Um, so, like I said, we, we do understand, um, but there are a number of initiatives announced and some mm. that have continued to be implemented and would expect that that flows to the see, system. Do you get it when people say they don't have money? Uh, to some extent, but also, I mean, people get money if they work. Mm. Because we are in a market economy. Mm -hmm. But we also know that there are problems with job cre employment creation or employment generation. Uh, government has done its bit with NAPCO, recruiting teachers, recruiting the nurses. Mm -hmm. A large number of people have been added onto the public sector workforce. Mm -hmm. But the second thing related to the employment is the incomes level in this country. I mean, if you take a single spine, mm -hmm. it, uh, the average income there is about a thousand Ghana cities. And if you live in a crowd with a thousand Ghana cities, it's a challenge. But I mean, government interventions like free SHS means that the school fees somebody should have paid, the person didn't pay. And it's true when the minister says that by those interventions, they put money in people's pocket. But Bernard, it's also important that in these discussions, we do some political economy analysis. Who is talking? Who are you hearing? Because there's also a point where people would dismiss government interventions like free SHS from Accra because they are not benefiting or for them it's really nothing. But those in the village, is really helpful intervention for them. I mean, if you do an analysis of the things you guys do at Christmas, you interview people at the market, every Christmas was worse <laughs> than, than the, the previous one. The previous we never had a better Christmas. So you need, to, you need to be able to discern some of these things. But that's interesting. Let's talk about the financial sector. Started in August 2017. We are in November 2019. Mm -hmm. Only two days ago, SEC now announced 53 companies collapsing. Mm -hmm. Prof, has it taken too long? If you look at the way you are, because the financial sector issue, I'm not talking about banking. So August 2017, UT Capital Bank. Two days ago, we got an announcement that 53 fund management companies. So it's been two years, three months, and you are still doing a reform. Is that how reforms take normally? Yeah, uh, Ben, the financial sector is not a small sector. I mean, we have the banking, you have the capital market, you have all these together. And therefore, you don't expect to carry out reform within just uh, a year or two. It will take a bit of time. Because if you, if you look at our financial reform that we started in 1989, it went through a lot of processes before we got here. So you don't expect the government to be able to uh, use just two or three years to be able to clean up the system. Of course, when government, the new government came in, they have to understand the issue, what are the problems, and think through it, see which one to touch, which one not to touch, in order not to also hurt uh, the bankers, as also not hurt depositors. So they needed to take their time, state the situation, and so on. They couldn't have combined the reform in the capital market with the banking the banking sector did that three times. So for me, the way they are going is supposed to be the best. You ask yourself whether we needed to do it. I mean, if you have a problem and you want to solve, if you are sick, malaria, you need to take yeah, the drug. I mean, the difficult drug to be. But able doesn't to. the length of time prolong the misery? Because if you have the uncertainty, if you, I mean, I'm thinking of two years. It depends on you the have, problem. And don't forget, you have you have banks, nine of them. 22 savings and loans and finance houses, 347 microfinance, 53... Remember, Nigeria, Nigeria went through this process and it didn't take two years, it didn't take three years. It took a bit of time before they were able to clean up the system and then sanitize the system and get the banking financial system that they have now. So you don't expect that you start something in 2017 and by the end of even 2020, you expect that you would have done. I don't think that if... It's going to be clean up. I expect that within the next two, three years, that is where we will have very good. But let me say this uh, about the first one that you ask. You see, government is doing very well. You are asking, you are just implementing policies, taking money away. But Tony Kilik said something that he did study in the health sector, in the education sector, and it's in the education sector, if money is spent or money starts from Accra and you want to take it to, let's say, Boko, if it is 100, by the time it gets there, it's 35 cities. So on the way, 65 is lost. So that is something that we need to look at. Government may be spending, but as to whether the money gets to where it's supposed to get to. So, for example, when government reduces uh, tax 
for importers. They may sit on the increase and not pass it on to consumers. Exactly. That, is that could be one issue. Exactly. That is one issue. And also, we can also look at corruption as well. Because the corruption has a lot of levels. Not only the politician. So from Accra down there to the last person. But is that not why you corruption. people teach that we should have more targeted policies? So, for example, the World Bank will tell you that you, you need something like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Payment for poor people, LEAP. It's a better targeted poverty intervention than, say, fuel subsidy. Mm -hmm. Because fuel subsidy, the guy with the four wheel drive benefits. Mm -hmm. But if you give money directly to a poor person like mm -hmm. LEAP, then that issue of the money not getting to the intended person. So if you take something like free SHS and these policies you're discussing, if the policy is like somebody with a, 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 a shotgun just shooting, you can miss anybody. Unlike a sniper type of policy where you target the right person at the right place at the right time. So that's back to government's choices. Yes, of course. And that is, I mean, for free SHS, I see that is one of the best that we can ever have. Because if nothing at all, it will slow down population growth. At least those, should, I mean, those young people who have stayed at home and giving birth to many children, all of them are in school. So at least it will slow down the, the, the population growth by at least three years. So if nothing at all is good. But as to how the implementation is being done, it's where the problem is. Because I feel for government. Because some people need not uh, benefit from it because they have the means. So that is where every policy needs to be backed by research, thorough analysis to be able to target the person. Mm. But if you give it to everybody, some people don't need it, and then okay. it goes away. TUC, do you feel that the unintended consequences of the financial sector reform mm -hmm. are now biting? I think so. And I think, I mean, let me be clear. We have congratulated the Bank of Ghana and the financial authorities, the monetary authorities, for cleaning the banks. Uh, in a reform of this nature, you need time. It's only in Ghana that you do things in an emergency. <laughs> Sometimes you can build roads in an emergency fashion. <laughs> But also, you have banks that were on critical life support. And mm -hmm. that, one, that one, you don't really have time to, to plan a proper uh, kind of reform. So something needed to be done. But if you hear in the budget that we have spent 16 billion cities to do the cleanup, and then the next time you hear people that after two years, of consolidating their bank. They are still not gotten their debt. It's mm. worrying. Mm. So, uh, even when the thing takes time, I think we are getting to a point where the monetary authorities must act swiftly. Because it's not just... It has impact on the productive sector. It also has impact on families. People are really, really struggling when actually they have money. And I think the lesson is that, I mean, we shouldn't wait anymore. We should try and do everything possible to make sure that the 16 billion we have spent to save depositors money actually get to the depositors. And of course, we are told that nobody has yet been prosecuted, although there are court cases going on. Yeah. Is that a worry? The fact that you have done this for two and a half years, you spent 16 billion, and people are still working free. Although we know that it is acts of commission and omission, some of which were on the criminal, that led to this type of meltdown. Sure. Um, I think if I just step back to the point Prof made earlier yeah. on in terms of length, mm -hmm. you know, if you recall, 2007-2008 global financial crisis, 2009 mm -hmm. we're still in it, even 2010. Mm -hmm. And so these things take time. Uh, and I think the analogy would be uh, financial sector is like, um, if you like, cancer. You, it starts from here and quickly spreads through. So there's the systemic side of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and it takes time. Uh, I know that some of the decisions up to this point have been very painful, and mm -hmm. let's face it, we're all in this economy. Um, but I think the point you're asking, which is to say people are still working free, my, my personal view um, is that there's a lot more we can do to restore confidence, and that must happen very quickly. And, and that would take a number of uh, actors. Um, the state definitely has to add judiciary um, must act. Uh, the regulatory authorities are doing their bit, but I think that we we should not miss the lessons in what has happened. And I think that there is some element of customer education and financial literacy that we all need to pay attention to. And I think that's very, very important because if it sounds too good to be true, probably it is, and we need to pay attention to that. We definitely shouldn't miss the lessons 
in what has just happened and maybe continue to the government in front said of us. the finance said next year is a road year the year of roads is he shooting himself in the foot because the state of roads is really bad he has to maintain fiscal stability he can't overspend roads are high expenditure items is it an economic or a political promise that you are going to focus on roads because people are clamoring for roads is he going to regret it? Well, I, I think the reality in front of um, you know, anybody in politics, uh, maybe in government specifically, is that you are around an election year. And that is road is, is a critical component of what people are looking for. And I've, I've traveled recently across the Eastern Corridor, mm. and it's in terrible shape. Mm. If you ask me what's top of mind for me, even though I live in Accra, uh, that definitely is one. And so from the politics of things, I sense, um, that, that is top of mind, and so you want to address that. How we finance that is it's the, the critical element. And that's where I come back to, uh, from KPMG perspective, the revenue side of things will be critical, um, particularly what we do around digitization and uh, transformation of GRE. And there are a number of ideas that we have, particularly if you think about it in terms of is there a link between the Registrar General's Department where people get in today to ultimately when they pay taxes? Maybe there's a missing link there. People in this economy, maybe in the informal sector, pay SNIT, but do they pay taxes? How do we integrate the database of these key public institutions to have a broader view of the people who must pay taxes but are not paying? But if you want to digitize, why are you increasing talk tax? Because talk tax is a talk and spending of data tax. Sure. You are discouraging people from using this device. But the plan is to get more people to use this so you can find a way of roping them into the formal sector. Sure. So is the talk tax not a wrong-headed policy? Um, I guess it's, it's um, a difficult one to say. Uh, clearly, government took a position to increase that, and I think that's their policy position. Um, the reality is, my personal view, again, is to say... Definitely, we need to invest in digital infrastructure. And I'll give you an example because that definitely has some implication for productivity. And, and one of the things we have taught in-house is how much time do we spend in traffic today, right? Uh, and how does that impact on productivity? In the morning, you spend the best part of your time in traffic. And so can we invest more in digital and can we actually give incentives such that uh, companies can begin to look at some flex working hours. And that comes back to, okay, if you want to do that, why do you increase the talk tax? Or can you therefore give incentive to some other institutions to drive that uh, digital agenda in a way that kind of impacts productivity? We'll take another short break. When we come back, we'll read your messages and then we'll take predictions from my panelists. What do they expect to see next year? Top two predictions from each panelist. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. We're talking the economy. My guest, Dr. William Babuateng, professor, actually, head of Department of Economics, uh, Mr. Kobnau, Dr. Kobnau, to TUC, and Robert Jato, KPMG. Here are more comments. The finance minister says, come 2020, the process of doing business in Ghana will be simplified, digitization, etc. Will it translate into low cost of doing business? You don't add your name. Good evening, Bernard. This budget is purely election budget. It's just an empty budget from KT. So what are you all comparing the economy performance with so that we know whether we are doing well or not? Where we are four years on. So you want us to compare to four years ago. You want us to do NDC and PP. Okai Braco, watching the parliament and the noise that they make during budget sections tells me Ghana is not a serious country. Uh, good evening. All that I wanted to hear was when will the Akosombo Jacketi Road be fixed? This is Andy Buama. Well... So, Bernard, what is the meaning of the whole budget to me? Ask your panelists to summarize it for me. Eric inside Kukro BT. Bernard, budget without discipline and enforcement of law is just a joke. You don't add your name. Bernard, after listening to the finance minister, I realized that we need to have at least five to ten year plans as a country. Nurses are not posted. We need hospitals, schools, and beds. All these are absent in this budget. NBA from Ken Tampo. Um, there's a lot of comments. The government claims they use so much to clean up the banks and save depositors' funds, but depositors are still not getting their funds. So where did all these monies go? Joe in East Legon. All right. Um, I wanted to give you two minutes each to tell me two or three key things you think we should see, or your predictions for next year. What can I hear only be? We have an election year. 
the government says they have a fiscal rule, fiscal whatever. They are not going to go beyond the budget. Since ninety, since the year ninety six, the only finance minister who hasn't run a deficit in election year is Osafo Manfo mm -hmm. in two thousand and four. Do you, do you expect this minister to work within a, the deficit he's planned or the pressures? If you listen to the radio, pressures people say we want roads, we want cars, and those kind of things. Will he will he bulk? What's your comment on that? What's your prediction on the deficit? Well, I, I think that they have made a clear commitment. And let's remember that this is the first year of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Mm -hmm. So if you don't stay within that, you're actually breaking the law. Uh, and okay. I would expect that that local commitment, and I think the president said fiscal rectitude, um, it, it's, it's a commitment they, they've made. Um, we know that every election cycle, we go over and above, uh, we create a deficit in the region of 6 7%. So, so the work within the range? Staying within the five is, is reasonable. However, it's important to remember that in that 5%, the banking sector cost, and then I, I believe the energy sector costs are not being included. And I think that's an important point to remember. In terms of our topic, um, clearly, the support for SMEs uh, is critical, and I think there's something in the budget around enterprise credit uh, facility, and I think that's, that's, that's a, a good news for so businesses. That's for you. TUC, what's your prediction for next year? What's going to happen next year? I think there will be a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on the finances. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's, uh, when the minister says it's for roads, it means you are going to spend. But even if you cast your mind back to the media review, mm -hmm. the minister also said that we are rolling the 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 caterpillars. Mm -hmm. We are still not seeing the caterpillars. We hope that in 2020 uh, they will actually be rolled because the roads are actually bad. There will be lots of pressure from many quarters. Are you, are your, your workers are going to agitate. <laughs> Doctors have started already. <laughs> Nurses have been doing throughout. Lecturers. So your people are giving you pressure. Because there are backlog of issues that have not been cleared. So the strikes will come again. I'm not saying that. <laughs> so there will, but be, there will be pressure. There will be lots of pressure. But the, that pressure will not only come from workers. Okay. That pressure will come from interest groups within our political economy to exact their own pound of flesh. Because of election. Because of election. It will come from party food soldiers. Mm. Yeah. Because they must also, they must also eat. Uh, they must also eat. So, but, um, and I mean, within the context of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, we expect government to soak the pressure. Mm. But I will not be, I will not be too surprised if, 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 we, if, if we are not able to make if, it. If they bend to the pressure. Yeah. I will not be too Prof, surprised. what's your prediction for I sense, the I sense from the voice of the finance minister commitment to be prudent. Mm. But I don't think where I sit will be able to absorb the pressure mm. that will come. Not as Kobna said, not pressure from workers, but also pressure from his own people, even his colleague ministers, MPs. Because an election year, everybody will want to get his pound of fresh and mm. it, it is something that I don't envy him at all mm. wow. and of course at, in every election year government is vulnerable mm -hmm. in in the industrial relation uh, framework government is always vulnerable during election year and also so the pressure will move him small. the pressure will come from work the pressure will come from his own colleagues even at cabinet because they want to make sure they want that, to win exactly Wow professor William Bob Martin predicting that the pressure may cause the finance minister to bend a bit. Kobnauti also thinks the same, but KPMG says never. The man who's strong, he'll stay. So we've been here, Robert Jato, lead financial service strategy management consulting for KPMG. They have a budget event next Monday. We'll be there. TUC will issue a proper statement on the budget yeah. in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. And I know that they do that. And of course, Professor William Babwatin, who taught me labor economics at the university, for which I happily pass and for which I'm grateful. Thank you. My name is Bernard Abler. Thank you for watching the show. Uh, keep, keep with CTTV and we'll bring you some more programs later on. Stay with us. Hi, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video on CTTV's YouTube channel. Subscribe for more videos on The Point of View. My name is Bernard Abler. Thank you.